You got to show the legs, dude. Oh. If you're going to do that, that oh. that's what's so impressive about McAfee. Yeah. Those no one, legs. I know no one needs to see those. No one needs to legs. see these. No, Mac, but Mac I'm legs. saying yeah. McAfee's got the legs. I'll tell you those what, those are though. some impressive. McAfee might have the professional kicker punter legs for ten years, but uh, old Macadac here has been been doing some walking and some. Uh, Mostly just walking around uh, the neighborhood here too. It's <laughs> so, great to hear. Yeah, you know, yeah. To what restaurants? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, mostly all the Mexican restaurants in town. So mm-hmm. cancels out. If it cancels out a little sure bit, it does. not really. Actually, sure. keep t- keep telling yourself yeah. that. Yeah, it doesn't cancel yeah. out at all. In the least bit. All right, uh, Purple Daily here. This is a four question Friday, boys. Just like we do every Friday, we uh, we throw four questions in the air and we'll see where life takes us. Presented in part by our friends at TCL. Enjoy more of what you love with TCL TVs. And before we dive into Four Question Friday, I think we have a guy in our midst here who is going to turn it all around with his golf game. Mm-hmm. Declan Goff. You're going to start to see Declan move up the leaderboard at what? what's the course that you're going to play most often? Are you going to go down the street to Como? Uh, where where are you going to break 100 this year for the first time? Uh, probably Highland, actually, in St. Paul. Probably oh. Highland would be be my spot. Como, uh, I, I like Como. But Highland, Highland's more more my preferred spot there. So I'd say Highland nine. Might see uh, you might might see an underscore fifty, and so then it, they, they have two courses there technically. So I might, I'll sneak over to the eighteen and actually break the hundred there. So if you guys see a gallery starting to gather around eighteen, you'll know that Declan is coming down. Just needs bogey to break a hundred for the first time. You just need a double it. bogey. You see some good salad too from once. Dex. Oh yeah, some good salad. That's yeah, what Dex no, got going for him. No, no golf hats. No golf hats. Oh I no, not a, with that no, salad. No, no, not, not a lot <laughs> of golf hats. Just, just, just the visor. Yeah. Just the visor. Don't you be covering that yeah, up? No, no visors. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, you know, I'll John Daly rocking a smoke and a drink, and I'll be, I'll be ready to rock. No, I will not be doing that. However, though, my clubs will be looking well. Thanks to my friends, the PGA Tour Superstore. It was the van fitting experience. I went down there a couple weeks ago. I saw my guy, Ian. He analyzed my swing. I've been using these old, old clubs that are as old as I am. And it's, you know, like you do so much with an old club. It's like playing with a, with a rinky dink offensive line. Kirk Cousins knows what I'm talking about. Well, now my guy, Ian, hooked me up with basically the Christian Derisa or, you know, or the Panay Sewell of golf wow. clubs here. Wow. And now my game's going to the next level with different club heads and shafts. It's the PGA Tour Superstore, the van fitting experience. Go check it out. Amazing. Amazing. All right, boys. Four question Friday here. We're going to start off with this one. And, and, and I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to throw it back to Declan for a little context here. How good is Rick Spielman as a general manager compared to his peers? So, NFL.com, I love these kind of rankings, by the way. General Manager Power Rankings, NFL Draft Edition. So, not just General Manager all-encompassing, but yeah, football-y football, NFL Draft Power Ranking Edition. Okay. Vikings General Manager Rick Spielman checking in at number six on this list. Wow. Mm. Mm. And this is from Greg Rosenthal. This is a quick little write-up. He said, Spielman has quietly been with the Vikings since 2006 and received the general manager title in 2012. Selecting Justin Jefferson last year was the latest in a string of big draft hits, including Stephon Diggs, Daniil Hunter, Eric Kendricks, Dalvin Cook. Plucking five pro bowlers over the past six drafts is impressive, though Spielman's getting further removed from that 2015 bounty. The Vikings GM would rank even higher if not for a few first-round misfires in Laquan Treadwell, Mike Hughes, Garrett Bradbury, and a general struggle to solve the offensive line despite investing a lot of draft capital. So Rick Spielman, sixth on the general manager power ranking list. Do you have the other five in front of him? In front I do. of you? Okay. I do. Number Checking at number five is Mickey Loomis with the Saints. Number four is the tandem of the Bills with Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott. Number yeah, three Allen. is Josh Allen. Uh, yeah, Josh Allen. Allen. Big hit there. Uh, also, Stefan Diggs for a first round pick. I mean, come on. Uh, J- Jason Licht for, uh, at, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is number three. Number two is Kevin Colbert with the Steelers and Chris Ballard with the Colts, the number one okay, general with, manager. Okay, with you know, all due respect, because Tampa Bay has a good roster, but like, I mean, Tom Brady just sort of chose to play there, right? Like, yeah. are you, you're ranked third because Tom Brady wanted to live in a warmer climate and you had some cap space. Right, I mean, it's I don't know. I feel like if Tom Brady yeah, doesn't got, sign with Tampa, is, is that guy going to be but third? He shouldn't be penal- but he shouldn't be penalized for that. I mean, no. he got him. Well, where do you guys so so Judd Spielman sixth in general yeah. without having done like the full recon on like draft hits or misses for the other GMs? Like, does sure. that sound too high? About right? What do you think? Sounds maybe a little bit too high, and here's why: it's the the thing about it is 
Rich Billman, depth-wise, has done a really n- nice job, and I do think that he's done a good job of probably getting, for the most part, the parts, the pieces of the puzzle that his head coach, Mike Zimmer, wants. That being said, he has been in charge as GM since, I believe it was his deck set 2012, and he has been with this team since 2006, and you still look at that prolonged period of time, and yeah. through bad luck at times, and also just through ineptitude, this team has yet to find a quarterback who can be the quarterback for multiple years, and who can lead you to a Super Bowl. Uh, that is my, personally, that's my be-all and end-all, and it's a very big ask, but um, there are GMs who have accomplished that. So I think that from the day-to-day stuff and putting together the roster, he has done, for the most part, a really nice job. I do think the lack of a quarterback who's going to win you a Super Bowl, and keep in mind my personal opinion is that Kirk Cousins is not that guy, does get you dinged, but I think six isn't out of line, I would probably put him around 10th or so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so hard with some of these. I think, obviously, the, the fact that they... The fact that he's been around so long and they've never really come that close to winning a Super Bowl. I mean, I mean 09 is the closest they've come when he's... Been, now, he wasn't the GM in 09. Right, that was more Childress's baby. Yeah. And 17 was as close as they've come with him as GM and Mike as coach. But the problem with that is they got completely destroyed in the conference championship game. Yeah, I think the so first of all, I think people are too hard on Rick sometimes. Yes, he has flaws, offensive line and pass protection flaw. I would say uh, lack of young franchise quarterback that can carry you. Uh, you know, who's your ten year guy? He's been here long enough. He's had a couple swings at it. There's been some bad luck. There's things to rip him for. But when you are regularly relevant and and also making the playoffs every other year or so. You're a good GM. He's a good GM, not a great GM. I think six feels a little high. Six feels like borderline elite GM, and I wouldn't put him yeah. in the elite GM category. But I do think people, I think people are so quick to want him fired, not realizing how many dumpster fire GMs there really are around the NFL. And he is not a dumpster fire GM, Dex. And, and also, uh, he stops this ranking at 23 because obviously there's, I think there's like seven new general managers, and there's obviously you can't really judge a GM uh, with rookie guy. But the last pe- uh, last group on this list is John Gruden and Mike Mayock with uh, the Oakland Raiders rounding things. Former off coworkers. Yeah. For- they're they're last. In Mayock. They're last. It go the bottom from the bottom up. Gruden Mayock, David Gettleman with the Giants, Howie Roseman with the Eagles, Ryan Pace with the Bears, and then Steve Keim with. The card. How do you put? Okay, Ryan Pace has to be below the Raiders oh, tandem, doesn't and he? And Roseman didn't Roseman? I mean, Roseman won a Super Bowl. Bowl? Yes, yeah, but he they, did. They, that's train wreck since then. Well, so they I get they, it. they have, but you're a lot. But but that's the whole thing is if you win a Super Bowl and then you train wreck, that doesn't make you one of the worst. Hmm. And Ryan Pace is awful at his job. Hmm. Like he doesn't like. What does he find? Andy Dalton. Yeah, man. Stop discriminating so. against redheaded quarterbacks. Yeah, dude. Yeah, sorry. Maybe you should that, do some self reflection. That discrimin <laughs> that discrimination is going to keep up. Like Got that. nothing to do with the color you of Andy like Dalton's hair. All right, question number two here on Four Question Friday. So, A Rod and Mark Laurie bought the Timberwolves earlier this week. If you want five different discussions about that, go to the Mackie and Judd podcast. Go to the Score North MN YouTube page. Our our second daily show. So A-Rod and Mark, Mark Laurie, uh, e-commerce and tech entrepreneur worth a billion dollars. How would you guys assess the Wilfs as NFL owners? We did the Spielman ranking. How would you guys assess, like on a, like give them a grade. Give them like an A through F grade in their 15 plus years as owners of the Vikings. I'd give them a B minus. Uh, they, they're they good. Like they, they spend, now I, I get that they spend in a cap league, so... That makes it a little bit different, but Everyone they spend. Spends, yeah. But they're ag- but but they're aggressive when they can be. Um, I don't think they pull any punches as far a- as trying to win. Now, I've grown to think that their their philosophy of always trying to be good and not s- sort of understanding when the window is open and closed might hurt them because I think at the end of the day. They they look at the start of each year with the Super Bowl as their aspiration, but they're like, but I also think that there's a floor for them and like it's nine wins, which I would say that there's some years that the floor is just going to be four wins, but you're going to get a really high draft pick and that's awesome. Yeah. So I think there's some blind spots from them as far as being fans who just want to be relevant and, and good, and that might stop you from being great. But as a, if you're a Vikings fan, 
I think that, you know, you, you saw Red own this team. You, you saw the group of, what, 10 that own the team that sold to Red. Like, you saw a lot of dysfunction, ineptitude. Uh, this franchise at times, unfortunately, has been embarrassing. Under the Wilfs, for the most part, it never has been. I think they do a really good job. Could some things be tweaked? Absolutely. But, like, if if you were to rank the families and the people that own teams in this league, I'd put the Wilfs in the upper third. Like, I wouldn't put them first, but I put them... But I, I cer- I've I certainly seen a lot worse than this, and I think that they care, and I think that they... That that they do a good job by the fans. Yeah, Dex, I, I would grade them a B plus. I think they do a pretty darn good job. Um, I, I think they also are hands off enough where they're not going to make crazy football. Like they they let the GM and the coach dictate the football decisions. This is not a Jerry Jones situation where you are having a hierarchy and and a monarch basically controlling the whole show. I think they do a great job deferring the power. Um, yeah, look, they, they got a fancy new stadium now. They got revenue coming in. They don't want to ever be what Judd's saying and, and uh, accepting their fate and reality for the greater good of the longer haul. So that maybe lets, prevents them from being like an A uh, an A or an A-plus general man or an ownership group. But I think in general they do a dang good job. I give them a B-plus. You know what? Uh, uh, I, I don't think they get credit for spending really because every team is sort of mm-hmm. locked into a, a window of money that they can spend, right? Because it's a salary cap. There's a salary floor. But they do deserve credit for looking for opportunities to bring joy to fans with big splash moves, whether it was bringing in Brett Favre. You know, we can nitpick Kirk Cousins, but, like, that was a big splash move. Who's the best quarterback in free agency right now? Go. Go get him, right? Yeah. I think they get docked because, to me, it feels like they're more obsessed with avoiding a disaster season than they are in accelerating into a Super Bowl championship, right? They're... They're very comfortable, and I get it. They're very comfortable being relevant, but they're not as hungry to win a championship by their actions and by the franchise's actions than maybe some other organizations. So to me, that that knocks them from tier one down to tier two. So like yeah. upper third, I'm going to go B+. Plus. I'm with Dex on this one. They could be an A if they eventually, and, may, and this might involve a coaching change at some point. It might involve moving off of a good, not great quarterback, but... Um, can they can they get into like perennial championship contention would be the thing that brings them into an A. All right, question number three here for you guys is actually powered by our friends at Federated Insurance. Speaking of risk, I mean, the, the Vikings are brilliant at risk management, right? They're never going to go 1-15. and 15. They're never going to go 2-14. and 14. At least they haven't under the Wilfs. Um, and uh, that's where Federated can come in and help your business. If you, if you want to avoid that 1-15 in 15 disaster, you're going to need... All the tools and all the resources that Federated brings to your business. Find out more at federatedinsurance.com. And remember, at Federated, it's our business to protect yours, Football. boys. All right, question three. So uh, you get all these statements coming out from teams. I think the Giants sent one out. I want to say the Bears sent one out that the, the, the players are banding together and saying, hey, these optional workouts, these this offseason program, we just don't feel totally comfortable with the NFL's COVID protocol. Uh, we'd like everyone to get vaccinated, so we're we're just gonna we're gonna opt out of these optional workouts. So if um, I guess the question is, how much will the Vikings be hurt if players are uh, opting out of these off-season workouts here, which would make two years in a row with very minimal off-season workouts for the Vikings? Zim is calling guys right now. You're showing up, right? You're showing up, right? Like I mean, this COVID thing, it's done, right? Um, I actually think the Vikings. So we mock. OTAs, and I get that, but I actually do think that the Vikings would would benefit from showing up and taking part in these, because what's the one thing, and this was the thing about trying to go with basically a completely new uh, cornerback depth chart last year, right? Guys, based, guys were Zooming until training camp, and then training camp was different, and so the Gladneys and the Dantzlers and that, that whole crew came in here without any on-field experience to speak of, at least with the Vikings. So, when you look at the new guys that they're going to bring in now, I do think that the Vikings could potentially get a leg up if guys uh, show up. Now, we don't know if the Vikings are going to or not yet. I have not seen that. I have not seen a a statement issued by uh, the Players Association on behalf of, of the Vikings players. But, 
as much as we joke about OTAs and the workout program, uh, I do think that it would hurt them if they don't show up. If they don't, I don't blame them. But I'm just saying from a schematic standpoint of trying to install things, and you install a lot of stuff uh, during the course of the coming months on the field that you then know day one of training camp from having executed it on the field, I think it makes a difference. I think you're going to figure out how like legitimate OTAs and, and these mini work mini camps and volunteer workouts are. That being said, I think football is one of the most um, important sports where that that time together matters more than any other sport. Spring training, you know, a guy can a guy like Max Kepler can go one for forty and it doesn't really affect anything. Yeah. You know, a, a guy on the flip side of it, some guy could you know hit five hundred in spring training and still can't hit a major league fastball in the major league game. Hockey training camp, kind of in the similar boat. NBA preseason, I, I kind of look at it as a wash as well. Where football, I do think it matters learning that playbook. It's so much more than just lining up and playing football and big guy hits big guy. It is such more a, a bigger piece of pie than that. And when you're a new player and you're a rookie, you have to get all that time in. So I, I do think it matters to a degree. But I guess I guess you'll see if it, if it really does, if, if the Vikings end up being a very good football team without these mini camps. I think uh, in-person meetings are overrated, and I think teams showed last year that you can still play football at a high level when you just prepare over Zoom and injuries go down because you're not worried about guys tearing ACLs in a mini camp in May or June. And so uh, I think as long as as long as most teams are doing things mostly remotely, it just I, I think it really brings out who the creative and better teaching coaching staffs are. Listen, you're not going to be able to sit and, and work hands-on with these players for as many days. And so can you get your methodology across over a Zoom meeting, you know, th- you know three, four days does a week, whatever it looks like? Who, who does that hurt among hurts, coaches and teams? It hurts, the least, it hurts the least creative coaches and teams. It's going to hurt Zimmer because he. what does he want to do? He wants to get his players out there on the field and install things and be hands-on. So, That's who he is. And I, and I think, you know, you, you did see a direct... Uh, now Zimmer's going to say, "Yeah, I mean, like not having the right personnel out there was a big reason for our defensive downfall." But he is a very hands-on coach at training yep. camp, etc. We saw it early on with the guys like Xavier Rhodes, etc. Like he's very, very hands-on. So it will hurt the Vikings. But I say, listen, be more creative. It's the same way across the board for every team. So you got to find a way to be more creative. Football. All right. The uh, the NFL is considering going away from having so they've had a rule in place. Uh, is it accurate to say that you can only have one helmet that you wear? Yes, each player must wear one all year long. Mm-hmm. The same so, uh, one, yes. Yeah, so players can wear uh, more than one during the season. Which three teams should be the first to do throwback uniforms in your guys' minds? Right, question. because so if if you can wear um, different. Helmets, you, you therefore can go back to the throwbacks because then I, I can have an old school uh, design as well on a different helmet. This is very, I love I this like, question. I feel like there's a lot of teams that haven't changed their helmet for like there decades. Are, there are, but here are three teams. Here are the three teams that I would like to see go back to to a look from yesteryear. And they've all done it previously, but obviously not since this rule was put in. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the creamsicle oh, look, man. the old Buccaneers look. It's gloriously I need t- Tom bad. Brady in a creamsicle. Yes, uniform. but how great is that look? That's an <laughs> outstanding one. My second one, bring back Pat the Patriot, which they yes. used to do. Yes. Pat the Patriot. Why Pat the, Pat the Patriot is not the Patriots helmet logo right now? I don't get. Like, there's nothing that great. I I understand that it's laden with success, but like when I look at the Patriots current. Logo. There's nothing about it that I really like that much. Mm-hmm. Bring back Pat the Patriot. And the reason why I submitted this question to be asked is because my third one is the Vikings throwbacks that they wore when Favre was playing here with the darker purple. Yeah. That is the ideal Vikings look. It's glorious. I don't understand why they didn't readopt it back then, uh, but it is something. I think that look is so so clean and so great. And they, you know, they try different things, right? Well, we'll try and they just tweak it, but the tweaks don't help it. Go back to that. So I'm going creamsicles, Pat the Patriot, and the old school, more darker purple look. I'll throw another one in here. I would love to see the Houston Texans go with the Houston Oilers uniforms. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, bravo. Love that one. Bravo. Love that one. Yes. Bring back those those Haywood Jeffries uniforms. Or the the Titans can do it too, but yeah. And the Houston Texans, like what type of name is that? The Houston Texans. It's awfully repetitive. There's nothing about it that's good. No. Like Houston Oilers was such a great name. 
The Cleveland Ohioans. Ohioans? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. The Florida, Florida mans. You know, you could, you could even go that well, way. Florida man. <laughs> Florida man just naked, God. wandering around on the side of your helmet. That's the that's the logo right there. Yeah. The Dolphins. Bring back those old Dolphins ones or just have naked Florida man on the yeah. side naked of your helmet. Naked Florida man. I, I, That'd I be more like, like the, Jacksonville than Miami, though, I guess. Yeah. I do like the classic dolphin with the football helmet on and the Amen. orange thing, around, the circle around. I did love those dolphin ones. And the eagles. I love the eagle, the actual, that green yep. eagle. Full eagle. I love that one. The full eagle, yeah. Any love for the old Broncos uniforms? Oh, love the, the Oh, yeah. Jumping through the D. Yeah. That's at, that's at the top of it's okay. my list. No, I don't understand the Broncos. They're new again. It's okay. I, I always ask this question. What National Football League teams have improved their look by changing it? How many um, have improved their look? The, the Eagles have for me. Um, I like the Vikings' new colors better than the old colors, so I differ I love from the, you on that. Love the old Vikings colors. And, the, and I, I got to be honest, that old Dolphins logo, even though I grew up with it, it was kind of just confusing. It's like, is that a sun? <laughs> is it like a dolphin jumping through a yeah, sun? Like, I what? get it. I get you. I, I really liked understand. It. I, I really get it. it. Yeah. Oh, the Broncos though was way better. That's another good one. I love. That I don't. One. Uh, it's yeah. I, I do like the old Broncos one. I don't. I don't know if I hate the current one, but. Declan just, hate, Declan just hates be. horses, period. So he's yeah. probably just terrified every I'm time. He, he doesn't out. hate him. He's scared of him. I'm out. I'm out. I'm he out. Runs. I'm out. He I'm runs out. from horses. Nope. Come on! There. Football! And that is a four-question Friday for you guys here on Purple Daily. Daily Vikings Entertainment, and we've got less than two weeks until the NFL draft. So uh, I get my my second Pfizer shot the day before the NFL draft. Yeah, you mentioned it's this like yesterday. it's like a 50-50 shot that I'm going to be – like a 104 fever for the for the first yeah. round, but you know what? I'm here for it. If I have to sit here with like a, you'll bag just be of really tired and and lethargic. The way that's that you, my guess. The way that you felt after the 24 yeah, I was hours, tired, lethargic. Brain if someone would have said, "Dude, like the draft is tonight," you got to strap in. Would would you have been in any shape to give draft takes that night on Purple Daily? Oh yeah, they just would, wouldn't have been coherent. Yeah, Even but better. I mean that's ordinary for me. So some that's might fine. Argue, yeah. Some might argue. And, I yeah, think until exactly. Judd is literally in the ground, he would not miss that type of opportunity. I can oh yeah, that. if we're talking sports, then I'm yeah. Judd's I'm in. And, and part of the problem is they like they give you the se- that you don't get to like pick a date. They just like they you give go. you the second date. So, yeah, and you'll know, and you know what? Do. You say thank you very much. Yeah, man, take enough. it because you're you very, thank you very you're much. You're vaccinated now, baby. Call Randy Moss and give me my second yeah. vaccine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you stop? You don't have to pull your pants down, you. Whoop. All right, we're gonna go now. Pants. That's a wrap on today's episode of Purple Daily presented by TCL. We'll see you guys tomorrow.